Ludwig, who finishes alone at seven under, first major start, finishes second. No three putts all week. Steely nerves of youth. And he's got himself, obviously, in the top 10 in the world. Afterwards, Ludwig Oberg had this to say when he addressed the media. Quoting, this is just part of it. Playing here at Augusta National is a dream come true. Just to be in this situation, feel the nerves and feel the pressure walking down the last couple of holes is what you dream of. This is what I've always been wanting to do for such a long time. And it's quite surreal to actually have the opportunity to experience it. But I'm so proud of me, myself, and all the people on my team and my family and everyone involved. This being my first major championship, you never really know what it's going to be like until you're there and you experience it. I think this week has given me a lot of experiences and a lot of lessons learned in terms of those things. It makes, to, to, it makes me really hungry. It, it makes me want to do it again and again, I think. Close quote. So he went on to say with, in, his, in his post-round press conference with the media that the ball that he hit into the pond at 11, which I love the way he reacted to that because he kind of smiled. He kind of let it roll off his shoulder. Not, it didn't change the, the perspective that I had that that was the end of his Masters because at that point, Scotty Scheffler, you know, had jumped into a phone booth and, and came out as, as Super Scotty. And the sense was you can't in that, as, in that instant, you can't really mess up because it didn't look like Scotty Scheffler was going to, even though we know that around every corner, Augusta National can consume your hopes. And there was that possibility of Scotty Scheffler, definitely. But he didn't. And so reasons for concern about Ludwig hitting it into the pond at 11 turned out to be spot on. But he said afterwards, and this is what I was getting to, he had been aiming at the right side, just outside the right side of the green on 11. And when he hit it, he said that one started left but by his, by his line, by his initial line. But it was hit by wind as well, and it just pulled it left, and that's what happened. I thought it was just an interesting. I love when players recount for us what they were thinking, what took place, et cetera. And then the way that he hung in there and the way that Ludwig did the things that he did down the stretch. Ludwig has that double bogey at 11, Right? This was after he had birdies at seven and nine, which were impressive. He also had a birdie at two. He pars 10, has a double bogey at 11. You can, you can kind of feel the air coming out of the balloon, maybe from a fan's perspective more than his because the way he reacted. He, go, he pars 12, and it was a good, solid, rock-solid par at 12. I was wondering because what happens at Augusta, I find, is that bogeys and double bogeys tend to come in bunches. Rock solid par 12, then he birdies 13, and he birdies 14. That was pretty impressive with what he did there. Okay, back to, back to our list of the best of the rest, so we continue this conversation. Where do you want to start? Let's go Max Homa. First of all, Max Homa has his best major finish in a tie for third. Last week when we were leading into the competition, we had a discussion on this show, which I wholeheartedly believe to be the case, that the most important stat at the Masters is greens and regulation. Max Homa tied for first in the field in greens and regulation. All things considered. The wins, everything else. Max Homa is now, if he wasn't already, recognized statistically, even though the world rankings, I think it's, it's, it's generally agreed by all, are, are currently flawed. He'll move into the top 10. Max Homa had this to say about his play following, quoting, I thought I handled myself great. I didn't make any putts. I really didn't feel like I blinked. 
I would have loved the ball on 12 to not go in the foot of the Ivy, but I hit a good shot, and I think I did that all weekend. Scotty is an amazing golfer. It's really impressive. Obviously, I was going to need to play some spectacular golf today, but I did not. But I thought I played some really good golf, so I'm proud of that, and it was a really fun weekend. Obviously, I need to prove that I can win one, but winning is fickle. I know, I know the way I played today is good enough to win. If the putts don't go in, the putts don't go. I actually think it'll put me at ease a little bit for the majors to come. Andrew grabbing that quote was so good and so central to who Max Homa is. And it goes back to the conversation that we were having before the break about the it factor, the full package, as, as they would say with the, you know, the singing competitions and things of that nature. I think Max Homa is the type player that people are actually really interested in. I think he's a type player that people really like. I think he's a type player that people really want to cheer for. He has that it factor. You know, when he was in Butler Cabin speaking with Scott Van Pelt, he was talking about playing with, with Tiger Woods. He was talking about that, that he himself at times was swept up as a fan, just looking over there kind of like this pinch me. Can you believe what I'm doing? And there was a connection. It was so cool. Whereas you'll, you'll, have, other, you'll have other top players, and, and, and Scotty Scheffler at times is like this. Uh, John Rahm is like this. Brooks Kepka is like this, where when they're in front of the media, the sense is, is that they're uncomfortable. Tiger's, Tiger spent his whole career that way. Until now, actually, honestly, he, he's, he's far more forthcoming and, and friendly. But there's this sense of, of platitudes and, and, and armor that they surround themselves with. It's hard to get a sense of, man, I'd really like to hang out with that guy. You see it in other ways. Whether it's a you know a Netflix show or what have you, you start to feel like you get to know the people better as humans, which honestly is what we've always aspired to here. We always tr- we're trying to show you players or, or prominent people outside the persona that you think you know. We talk about it all the time with Gary Woodland. It was great to see Woodland playing at the Masters, where on the course I would say I've always said this about Gary. Gary looks like he's a gladiator. It's like. Mm-hmm. But off the course, outside the ropes, he's the nicest guy in the world. And John Ryan was talking about that. Where he was like, yeah, I'm a different person inside the ropes than I am outside the ropes. And we get the same impression when you've seen the videos, whatever. Is maybe it's a, you know, a sponsorship thing or what have you. But you get these glimpses of, again, Brooks Kepka, And, you know, he's running around, sliding on the grass and playing with his dog and all this stuff. And you're like, wow. And then Brooks is even a little bit more... Uh, forthcoming with with that side of who he actually is in his life if you follow his social media and they're showing him and, and you know they're out dancing someplace or you know living it up and 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 uh dj you see him on a boat fishing and all so all i'm saying is that max holma is one of those that in that competitive arena and i'm not judging that it should be one way or the other i'm just saying what it is in that competitive arena you see him it's not the competitive him and the other him. It's him. And he was telling that story to SVP about what it was like to be playing alongside of Tiger Woods. And I think everybody watching could feel it and understand. That was a human moment. It was a connection. So I love the way that Max is reacting to all of this. He didn't measure it by what he didn't do. He's measuring it by what he's done. He's measuring it by this ascent, this step-by-step that's okay. And it was really cool. And he's a really easy guy to cheer for, right? Back to our best of the rest again as we keep marching down this path. Two to go. Colin Morikawa. Eighth time he's finished in the top 10 in a major championship. We heard it all week. You heard it every time they showed him. He's a great ball striker. Right? He was third in greens and regulation. Pretty dang, darn good. 
tied for third in driving accuracy at 82%, although he, he, he did say his lack of distance as comparison to Scotty Scheffler cost him. He was talking about, I forget what hole he was talking about, but he said, yeah, I was coming in with a five iron and Scotty was probably a seven or an eight iron. That angle matters at greens that are like hitting onto a kitchen table. Colin Morikawa spoke, though, about his play and what cost him. Remember, Colin Morikawa, he went all pars until the eighth hole he had a birdie. And then he doubles nine. Pars 10, he doubles 11, hitting it in the water. You could hear him just scream when he did it. To his credit, birdies at 13 and 15, but the die was cast. He said, I got greedy. When you're playing really good, you don't get greedy. And I got greedy on nine. I got greedy on 11. I wasn't pressing. I just was trying to hit it a little bit too close. And greed can get the best of us. I'm not going to take a lot from this week. It's been a rough season so far, but hopefully this is kind of the turning point. Oh, he said, I'm going to take a lot from this week. Sorry. Hopefully this can be kind of a turning point. I've seen a lot of good in watching Scotty today. I know it's doable for me. I've just got to put the pieces together. Close quote. It goes back to the conversation we were just having. Not to divert it all back to Scotty Scheffler, but I'm giving you the sense of what another competitor is doing. Instead of watching Scotty and saying, I can't do what he's doing, he watched Scotty and had the complete opposite reaction and said, oh, I know I can do it. He's already a multiple-time major champion himself. He's got as many major wins as Scotty Scheffler. I do think, though, that given the way that Colin Morikawa plays, that he's going to have to pick his chances. For example, I think Scotty Scheffler should develop into a pretty good U.S. Open player for obvious reasons. May not be long, but accurate. You got to hit the fairways. Got to hit the greens. Right? He's already won an Open. But I think he's going to be really good at Opens. If it's if it's dry and hard and fast, watch out for Colin Morikawa. But I loved his honesty. I said this to you earlier in the show. I love the fact that he said to us, no, I got greedy. Flat out said it. And again, to me, that's that human connection. I I happen to think that Colin Morikawa has the it factor too. I've told you this guy, you guys, this story before. When he was introduced at the Travelers Championship. They had the press conference. He was up there with other guys, but he was up there. And we asked different questions. And I asked the assembled, I said, you know, when you become a tour player, you become the, in his case, the Colin Morikawa Corporation. You're your own brand. What do you want your brand to represent? And I'll never forget how he answered me. He said, my smile. Think about that for a second. Think about, think about your grandmother's advice. That said, smile to the world. Don't don't greet it so hard. Greet it with with a with a little bit of of grace to you and to everybody else. And here's here's a kid at, at that age at that time hadn't accomplished anything professionally yet. It was brand new, and he had the presence of mind to say that his smile is the thing that will distinguish him, that will set him apart. Didn't talk to me about prospects of winning events or, or, or contending and winning major championships. It was his smile. And I thought that was a really cool sense of understanding oneself. And he continues to educate us from that standpoint and what it could mean moving forward. All right. And then the last of our best of the rest that we were featuring just because of, of where they all finished, of course, was Tommy Fleetwood. And I loved how Tommy was doing what he was doing. And, and I, I won't deny that this is probably influenced by the way that we were consuming the coverage of the Masters at this point. Right? The TV side. Tommy Fleetwood seemed to be quietly going about his business. Tommy Fleetwood, he who, who used the local caddy, which was a great story in and of itself,
Finishes tied for third with his seventh top three in a major. Seventh top three. Second in driving accuracy. No bogeys, no drop shots on his card yesterday. That's what I mean about it being just quietly going about his business. Did Tommy Fleetwood. Here's what Tommy had to say afterwards. Again, we're just grabbing bits and pieces. Quoting, you know, eighth time at the Masters, and this is my first top ten. Hopefully, it'll be a top five, and that'll be a fantastic week. You just keep playing. You never know what's around the corner. But yeah, I love this week. It was great being out late on Sunday and playing a good round of golf and just another major championship where you're at the right end of the leaderboard at the right at the end of the week, right? Who knows if my time will ever come. But all I can do is keep trying and put myself there and keep having performances like this, and then we'll see. Close quote from Tommy Fleetwood. I, I was very impressed with Tommy. I am very impressed with Tommy. I know the people that they're hearing that are going to look at that and go, you know what? He's got to win. He's won multiple times on the, what's now called the DP World Tour, formerly the European Tour. He hasn't won yet on the PGA Tour, and they look at Tommy and say, he's got to win. He's a great ball striker and all the rest, the flowing locks. But Tommy is another player that's pretty easy to like. He's a good guy, comes from humble roots. He's honest. So all of this, it's just, it's, it's just in the swirl of the nature of the moment following, right, that we have the conversation of what is, what is it going to mean for the majors going forward, right? It's natural because we're, we're in the thick of it now. I, I think, again, I, I just was talking about Colin Morikawa at the Open. I, I wouldn't be surprised. If I had to pick two early favorites for Royal Troon, I would pick Morikawa, and I would pick, pick Tommy Fleetwood. Influenced by the immediacy of, of what took place, of course. No denying that. But those, those would be two. Right off the top.